This time on Landmarks, we stop at Portsmouth's popular tourist attraction. Witness the preservation of a presidential monument. Visit an English palace. And journey across San Francisco's famous icon. But first... China's Great Wall is one of the few man-made objects that can be seen from space. It stretches across more than 6,400 kilometres of winding landscape. And during its 2,000-year history, the wall has survived threats from Mongol hordes, Japanese invaders and the Red Guards. But today it faces a different kind of threat. Tourists. Over 10 million a year are taking their toll on the now delicate structure. A British expatriate, William Lindsay, has been documenting changes to the wall in detail. Armed with a stills camera and tripod, he has re-photographed the Great Wall at about 140 locations, stretching from the northwest Gobi Desert to the Yellow Sea coast in the east. He carries an archive of 300 old photographs and matches his shots to the first pictures taken as far back as 135 years ago. He recently exhibited 72 pairs of his best then and now at a museum in Beijing. I saw an old photograph of the wall taken in 1907 and I'd taken the same picture in 1987. It was the same location but there was a big tower in the middle of the photograph that disappeared. It had gone and it made me think how the Great Wall was slowly changing before our very eyes. I think this is a good summary. It reminds people that even the Great Wall of China, one of the world's greatest buildings, will not just stay there, it has to be protected in a positive way. Lindsay says that some parts now receive more visitors a month than they saw in the past three centuries combined. But the wall has finally received its first legal protective measures. Just over a month ago, state laws to protect the whole of the Great Wall were introduced. So now, there is no Olympic threat to the Great Wall, whereas five or six years ago there was. It's now impossible for a developer to lease land beside the wall and build an Olympic resort to give guests a room with a view. It's impossible now, and that's a good thing. The wall, which the United Nations listed as a World Heritage Site in 1987, has been rebuilt many times throughout the centuries. Leading Great Wall expert Chen Dalin says it is the key to the Chinese identity the Great Wall reflects and records China's history. It is a carrier of history. So if we protect it and do a thorough research of it, people can understand China's past. If we understand China's past, then we will have a better understanding of the Chinese people, and this will help us to be more confident in the future. The new law means that people face substantial fines for damaging the wall. But not all Chinese are aware of its value, says Guo Chiyoyen, one of Lindsay's local guides. Because I live right at the foot of the Great Wall, sometimes I see villagers take the bricks from the Great Wall and use them to build their houses and yard walls. I think this behaviour should be controlled by government officials. The government is now ensuring original bricks and real mortar are used in renovation projects, and the long stretches open to tourists are kept rubbish free. Well, actually, I found it in better condition than I had expected it to be. Given the age of it and uh, the number of people that have been here, I would have expected it to be more run down. And, uh, you know, in particular, the lack of trash it was actually quite impressive, so it was, uh, it, it did exceed my expectations. But just beyond the tourist-friendly stretch, crumbled bricks and eroded guard towers stretch for kilometres. This is still what most of the wall looks like today. It is hoped that the interest the Great Wall attracts will lead to a concerted conservation movement that will enable future generations to enjoy one of the great wonders of the world. Coming up, the Spinnaker Tower.
the Spinnaker Tower dominates the skyline above the ancient port city of Portsmouth in the south of England. The building, which opened in 2005, is a remarkable combination of artistry, architecture and engineering. It was the people of Portsmouth's idea. The design for the Spinnaker Tower was chosen by, in, in a competition run by the local newspaper and they had three choices and this design based on a sail of a, of a yacht was chosen by the people of Portsmouth I think probably um, about 10 years ago. The 170 metre tower gives spectacular views of the Royal Naval Dockyard at Portsmouth where visitors can watch warships being put through their paces. There is also a bird's eye vantage point to observe the historic dockyard, home to the famous HMS Victory, Nelson's flagship at the Battle of Trafalgar in 1805, and HMS Warrior, one of the first steamships built for the modern navy. But monumental buildings or iconic structures have now become part of a city's um, sort of profile and positioning. And the design for the tower was based on really giving Portsmouth a landmark and giving it a modern structure to, uh, to sit and complement all the history, the history and heritage around us. The Spinnaker Tower has been popular with tourists from the beginning. Its one millionth visitor came less than two years after its opening in 2005. And like many vertical structures, people seem to want to climb it, or in this case, descend from its peak, as seen in this abseiling display by the Royal Marines Commandos. The joy is that everybody who comes up loves it and that makes it the easiest and most delightful visitor attraction project to be involved in. When you actually get the feedback from visitors who go up in the lift, step out onto that view deck and go, wow, everything else after that is really just about dealing with success. Portsmouth could once claim to be the heart of the British Empire. Its navy was its strength. Another well-known resident in Portsmouth is the Mary Rose, Henry VIII's 16th century flagship. Like much of Britain, the waterfront in the city is undergoing enormous redevelopment. There are new shopping centres, restaurants and, of course, the amazing Spinnaker Observation Tower. and it's to everybody's credit that the city has regenerated itself in this way. The fantastic shopping area that we're standing on now, the developments within the dockyards, the new attractions that are there, the lovely boutique hotels that are popping up around Portsmouth. The city is changing and the tower represents that shift towards a brighter future. Like anything worthwhile, the view has to be earned it is a long way up. The success of this new attraction has certainly put Portsmouth on the map and helped to revamp its image as a UK holiday hotspot. The tower has three glass-enclosed viewing decks for visitors to enjoy the fantastic views across the harbour and over to the Isle of Wight. And the viewing decks have something for thrill-seekers as well, the glass floor, which lets you look all the way down to the waters below. Mount Rushmore in South Dakota is one of the United States' most famous mountains, and to many, it's the country's most precious. Carved into the rock are the faces of four US presidents, George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, Abraham Lincoln, and Theodore Roosevelt. Washing some of the largest and most stared at faces in the world is no easy feat. Cleaning the white granite faces, each 18 meters high, is a large and sometimes dangerous challenge. In 2005, 
a German company spent five weeks removing years of dirt, grime and lichen for free. But since the remarkable sculptures were completed in 1941, the spring face wash has been an annual task and so far no fatalities have been recorded during its construction or maintenance. The annual cleaning of the memorial is a specialised task, which until recent years was made more difficult by the fact that the area was inaccessible, which meant that workers needed to carry their own equipment. The process largely remains the same. A man is lowered over the memorial in a special harness. How long the job takes depends on the weather. If it's fine, the faces can be cleaned in a week. But if the weather's bad, conditions become very dangerous and the men have to stop work and leave the giant monument to the mountain goats. The memorial was conceived as a shrine of democracy with the presidents representing the founding, expansion, preservation and unification of the United States. After receiving the commission in 1924, sculptor Gutzon Borglum selected the Mount Rushmore site in the Black Hills, believing that its dimensions of 300 metres long and 130 metres wide suited his purpose well. It proved an inspired choice, but the task was monumental. From 1927 until its completion, more than 350 people were employed to help its carving. 90% of the mountain was carved by dynamite. The remaining fine finishing was accomplished with air hammers. Workers became so skilled that using dynamite, rock could be removed to within a few inches of its finished surface. One by one, the faces were uncovered and dedicated. Washington in 1930, Jefferson in 1936, Lincoln in 1937, and Roosevelt in 1939. Today, more than three million people visit Mount Rushmore each year. Borglum said of his great work, a beauty in stone that bears witness to the great things we have accomplished as a nation, placed so high it won't pay to pull it down for lesser purposes. When Gutzon Borglum carved the faces, he saved the white granite dust which is stored in a cave in the memorial. It is mixed with linseed oil and white lead and painted over the relief to hide the scars of winds and rain. But by May 1992, the monument needed further careful restoration. It was feared that historic features were in danger of disappearing. Borglum's mixture of granite dust, linseed oil and white lead had finally been superseded by more modern materials. Workers used a new type of sealant on the mountain in hopes of making the monument more resistant to erosion and other detrimental weather conditions. The sealant covered cracks in the faces. And with so much loving care and attention, the faces are looking as good as new a fitting preservation of one of the world's great landmarks. Coming up, Blenheim Palace. Blenheim Palace near Oxford is sited on over 2,000 acres of stately gardens. For nearly 300 years it has been one of Britain's grandest homes, but with the costs of maintenance running into millions of pounds a year, visitors are now a vital source of income. Within the palace we've got superb staterooms filled with gold and silver and paintings and tapestries and furniture, so a really archetypal, splendid palace within. We have a very simple room, which is probably one of the most moving rooms I think in the palace. It's the room where Winston Churchill was born. Blenheim Palace and its extensive grounds were given to the Duke of Marlborough by a grateful Queen Anne in celebration of his famous victory over the French army at the Battle of Blenheim in 1704. The palace is still lived in by the Duke's descendants, the Spencer Churchill family. This room is kept much as it was when Winston Churchill was born here in 1874. He went on to become Britain's Prime Minister during World War II. Churchill, the former primary, huh, is uh, so great in our, in our heart, okay? He's a so famous person. 
and I'm very proud about him and respected about him very much. He's a great person. Pretty impressive, pretty extraordinary, in fact, to be able to see a complete history of England in many ways in one place. Inside, the scale of the palace is beautifully balanced by the intricate detail and delicacy of the carvings, the hand-painted ceilings, and the amazing porcelain collections, tapestries and paintings displayed in each room. Situated in Woodstock, just eight miles from Oxford, the palace was deemed a World Heritage Site in 1987. Designed by Sir John Van Bruen, the palace is a treasure house of three centuries of British history and European art. Blenheim Palace is set on 2,100 acres of beautiful parkland, landscaped by the famous landscape gardener, Capability Brown. It comprises sweeping lawns, formal gardens and a magnificent lake. The palace is one of ten magnificent palaces, houses and castles whose owners and trustees have come together to promote England's heritage under the banner of Treasure Houses of England. Leeds Castle, used by all the English kings over the Middle Ages, followed by 500 years of private ownership, has been open to the public for the past 25 years. Leeds attracts nearly half a million visitors every year, but tourist organisations want even more people to enjoy these unique properties. So representatives from a number of notable properties came together to promote their attractions. We do have everything from the National Motor Museum at Bewley through to guided tours at Castle Howard with people in period costume, going behind the scenes at other houses, and indeed, of course, we've got safari parks, places like Woburn. Um, so, and the Butterfly House, for instance, at Blenheim. We've all got something a little extra, and we try and give the public what they want. After all, it's a very competitive market out there, and unless we move with the times, we're going to get left behind. They're a tremendous asset, and what you've seen now is them working together, making them much more user-friendly. And I think some of the, uh, the schemes that uh, we've got developing, which are people who probably wouldn't actually go to these stately homes, because it's not for them, but that's now changing, and as I say, we're making them much more user-friendly. So I think in terms of that part of it, it's very important working the 10 uh, treasure ha houses together also is important. Between them, these properties are home to some of the most important art and antique collections in the world. Each house, whether it's Harewood House or Bewley, is not only a distinctive architectural masterpiece, it is also a continuing example of England's historical past. The treasure houses combined attract more than 4 million visitors every year. Organisers want those numbers to continue to grow. When it comes to landmarks, bridges are a special category. They are a practical and sometimes spectacular symbol of unity, the joining of two sides previously separated. San Francisco's Golden Gate Bridge is one of the world's most famous. It connects the northern tip of the San Francisco Peninsula to Marin County as part of US Highway 101. Built in the 1930s, the Golden Gate Bridge's 1,400 metre long main suspension span was a world record that stood for 27 years. The five-lane bridge crosses Golden Gate Strait which is about 130 metres deep. The bridge's two towers rise 245 metres, making them 60 metres taller than the Washington Monument. Its setting and design is dramatic. Bridging San Francisco Bay, the horizontal tower with its wide vertical ribbing accents the sun's light. The towers that support the suspension cables are smaller at the top than at the base, emphasising the tower's 65 metre height. The Golden Gate Bridge opened ahead of schedule and under budget at noon on May 28, 1937. The traffic began to roll when President Franklin D. Roosevelt pressed a telegraph key in the White House announcing the event. Now in its 70s, the bridge still has a number of unexplained mysteries surrounding it. 
The bridge has been described as a massive work of art, but nobody knows who drew up the final design. It was built during the worst years of the United States' Great Economic Depression in the early 1930s. Never before had so long a bridge been attempted with such high towers. Builders had rarely been confronted with such dangerous tides. Most of those who worked on it made only five US dollars a day. One of these workers, Mr Rich Zellner, said many people at the time claimed the bridge could not be built. I think the big thing was everybody said we couldn't do it and uh, most of us guys took it personally. We felt a real accomplishment uh, that we did it. We felt we did it. It took four years to complete and it set many records. The cables were the longest ever spun using 128,000 kilometres of wire. A vast safety net saved the lives of 19 men, but just before the bridge was finished, a scaffold collapsed and the net tore loose. 11 men fell into the water and only one survived. I had a kind of a controlled fall because I had my hands in a piece of the net, so before we hit the water I straightened up and hit feet first. The Golden Gate Bridge cost $35 million to build. Longer bridges now exist, but officials say it remains the most photographed object in the United States. It also attracts desperate people. More than 1,200 have jumped to their deaths from the bridge. However, it remains an inspiration to many, especially to writers and musicians who have frequently used the bridge as a subject during its 70-year life. San Francisco has grown to be one of the world's great cities, and on an average day, the bridge pours more than 100,000 vehicles onto its streets. The bridge doesn't just carry motorised traffic. The Eastern Walkway is for pedestrians and bicycles during weekdays, but only during daylight hours. The Western Walkway is open to bicycles on weekday afternoons, weekends and holidays. The slow traffic is rewarded with the best views. The bridge view is beautiful at most times of the day, especially between October and late November, where the bridge is spectacular at every angle. Its distinctive reddish colour makes it a favourite place for photographers and tourists alike.